We come from many scattered places and lives to find our hope in the call that we are one in the Lord. So in the unity of our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, may our hearts find that rest by trusting in the love and the salvation of our Lord. Welcome to Dallas, Texas, a city that has uh, become known as one that can experience winter, spring, summer, or fall all in one day. But also, welcome to Eastminster Presbyterian Church, where we give thanksgiving not only for the seasons, but for all of the seasons of our lives. And our prayer this morning is that as you worship with us, that you will be reminded that the Spirit is with you in whatever season of life that you are in. And we pray that uh, you will embrace that gift of the saving grace of God in Jesus Christ. Just a few announcements even for those of you who are watching via social media who might be looking for a place to call home and a place to worship and gather. We are blessed to be able to announce that uh, we will once again worship in our sanctuary beginning on Friday, April the 2nd, Good Friday at 6.30 p.m., uh, then we will begin worshiping on Sundays, and we will start with that glorious Sunday we call Resurrection Sunday Easter on April the 4th, and that service will begin at 11 o'clock. And just let me assure you that for these services and all of the services to come, we are indeed following the CDC guidelines to keep everyone um, as safe and healthy as we possibly can. You can find uh, those protocols, those guidelines on our website at www.eastminsterdallas.org. And we are uh, hoping, hoping that uh, we will once again enjoy each other's company, even as we continue to remain uh, somewhat distant from one another in space, but most certainly close in heart. As the restoration of our educational wing continues following the great ice uh, storm, we will uh, continue to meet for Sunday school, for Bible studies, for Eastminster Presbyterian women, uh, for all of our other activities and meetings. We will continue those via Zoom or other social media until that time in which we can get back into our educational wing. There are multiple uh, prayers, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of concern, and all of those we will lift to the Lord in our service. However, if there are names uh, that you wish to let us know about, please feel free to call the office and ask that we include those prayers in our Sunday services. For now, though, you can find those prayers also online in the liturgy for this week. We are glad to be almost in the house of the Lord. We are eternally grateful that wherever we have been, it has still been the house of the Lord. Wherever we are, God is there. So as we begin worship this morning, let's pray. You are here, Lord, in this place, and in every place. And not only do we stand in awe of how great you are, larger than our imagination, we also can scarcely comprehend that you are really with us in this moment. In extraordinary as well as common everyday ways, you make your presence known to us. So this is your time of worship, God. Do great things with us right now and in the week which lies ahead. This we pray in the name of our Lord. Amen.
In becoming one of us, God became poor so we could receive the riches of mercy. In coming to us, God took on our death so we could be made alive together with Christ. So come, offer your confessions, knowing that by grace you have been saved. Let us pray. Merciful and loving God, help us to empty ourselves of all that hinders your life-giving love to shine through our lives. Strengthen us with your spirit to be credible witnesses of your love as we experience it in and through Jesus, your Son, our Savior and Lord. Amen. How much does God love us? Enough to send the divine heart, hope, and spirit to us, not to condemn us, but to save us, not by our speaking or doing, but by God's good and precious grace we are saved. Thanks be to God. Amen. Old Testament reading this morning comes to us from the 21st chapter of the book of Numbers. We hear verses 4 through 9. Listen now for the word of God. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit, bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze, and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The end of the reading of the Old Testament.
Today, our gospel lesson comes from the book of John. And I dare say this is perhaps a passage that many of us are familiar with. And I dare say that it is a passage that we need to visit and revisit quite often. So, as we hear about that extraordinary love that God has for us, may we hear with fresh ears what the Spirit is saying to us. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, and whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. And indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and they do not come to the light so that their many deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that they may clearly see that their deeds have been done in God. Grass withers, the flowers fade. This eternal word of our Lord is forever. Amen.
I suspect many of us don't have to imagine this scene because we have actually lived it. You're tired. It's bedtime for your little ones. You have read the book, but you have to go back and read some of the pages because they know that you skipped them because they know the pictures. We've done that last sip of water. We've had that last potty break. The light is on. The comfort toys are under the cover with them. And yet their little tired eyes just keep finding ways to delay the inevitable. But you know that sleep is the best thing for your little one. And you are not going to budge. And so out of frustration or exhaustion, the little one cries out, I don't want to go to bed. I hate you. Hmm. I know what I think we would all say or how we would react, but what if we took a deep breath and instead we replied, I am sorry that you feel that way, but I still love you. You would hope that that would melt that little one's heart. But what happens if the comeback is this? Stop saying that. So you take another deep breath and you say, well, you know what, honey? Like it or not, I still love you. And that will never change. No more negotiating on bedtime or on love. This parent refused to make love conditional. It is a love that the child can accept or reject. And that is exactly how uh, the way that God loved the world. In Greek, the word hotos is translated as so, correctly so, but through the ages, it has been understood more as a matter of degree. You know that gesture that we do when we tell our children, we wrap our arms and we say, oh, we love you this much. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, but it is not exactly what the gospel writer had intended it that to be. It's not just a simple, God loved the world a whole lot. It goes much deeper than how much God loves us. It is about how God chose to show that unconditional love. God, through, uh, though divine, was willing to become human like us and into our world. God sent his only son to show us to how to be the people we were created to be. Humans weren't ready or perhaps not willing to be loved in that way yet. So Jesus took on all of those sinful ways that we put on our human spin of love and offered us another chance. Through the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of our Lord, we are saved. And we can deny or accept that salvation. And still God, like it or not, says to us, I love you, and that will never change. And on that promise, we can lay down our weary heads and we can find rest even in the dark times of our lives. There is no more reason to bargain or to negotiate. It is important um, to note that just prior to this reading for today, Nicodemus has come to Jesus in the dark of night with a restlessness, a yearning, a seeking. What do I need to do to be right with God? How can I have a more meaningful and purposeful life? And if we're honest, who among us has not done the same? We lie in bed, we stare at the ceiling, and we want to know, how can I live a life 
that is more meaningful and purposeful because of God's love for me. Now, Nicodemus has not yet heard John 3, 16, but the preaching and the teaching of Jesus have uh, obviously piqued his interest about this unconditional, eternal life that Jesus is talking about. It has stirred Nicodemus's heart, and that voice inside of him is telling him that there is more to God's love than he, a learned and respected leader, a Pharisee, needs to know. Despite his education and status among the uh, religious leaders, the Pharisees, he does not believe that he has an instant in with God. And so he comes to Jesus at night, perhaps because he doesn't want the other Pharisees to see it. Perhaps it's the only time that Nicodemus had time to do personal things. Or maybe the writer of John is reminding us of that symbolism of light as good and dark is evil. But whatever the reason, Nicodemus acknowledges that if anyone can help him find his way to settle that restlessness and longing, Jesus can do it. And whether Nicodemus understands it or not, Jesus knows that there, um, there, it is a deeper relationship that he needs with God, not simply more facts, more learning, more books about God. Nicodemus needs a relationship. He needs a change of heart. It's the only way that he is going to fully understand God's love is not about using bargaining chips or manipulating or even learning more facts. Salvation is that uh, turning one's heart back to God with your whole being born anew or born from above because it is only by God's power and not human power, human rights, human rituals or laws that can change us into the very good people that God intended. Now, either of these phrases, born again or born from above, most closely fit the original Greek understanding of born again. Jesus tells Nicodemus that his birth into salvation and eternal life isn't anything like his first birth. Salvation is a way back to God after life on earth. But, but, it is also about how to live with grateful hearts in every earthly moment that we have. You know, I think it is out of respect for this religious leader uh, that Jesus acknowledged that, you know, humans can't fully make sense yet of what Jesus is trying to say, uh, that we just have to have a fuller faith. And embracing this faith with the help of the Holy Spirit will lead Nicodemus and it will lead us to that better rest in our souls. Author Marcus Borg wrote that belief is not an intellectual learning of facts about God. It is a belief and trust and faithfulness that grows as our relationship with God deepens. He also reminds the reader that believing is about giving our heart without uh, giving our heart fully over to God. And when we can't give it fully, we miss, we miss some of the joy of our salvation. So, cue up grumbling <clears throat> and griping Israelites <clears throat> who have been freed from captivity and who are now growing ungrateful in their freedom. They don't like the food, they don't have enough water, and you know what, like it or not, God responds to that complaining by sending poisonous serpents among the people. 
As one commentator said, it's kind of like treating a broken arm by smashing a patient's toe with a hammer. Your arm may feel better but you're t because you're too busy screaming about your toe to complain about the arm. Israelites. The story of Moses lifting up the bronze serpent to save those who were snagged by those snakes leads John into that truth that God will lift up Jesus so that all who believe in him as their Lord will be given new life, an eternal life, but one that begins even in this life. That's a reason to uh, have blessed rest every single day. Choosing to believe in new life is a difference maker for eternal life. And choosing has always been part of God's plan of love and deliverance and salvation. John's message says to, uh, to us that even if we uh, choose darkness on our own, that through the salvation of Jesus Christ, we still have that choice to turn around and to follow him out of the world's darkness and into the Lord's light. It is the light of the Lord that helps us put aside that restlessness, that seeking, that yearning, that longing when the world's darkness seems to hover over us. Belief in Jesus as Lord heals life's deepest, darkest, most broken place, and that is that place when our relationship with God is disconnected. To return to the life that God intends for us, we have to be willing to accept that God's love comes in this way. Through the death of God's only Son, Jesus Christ. God's love comes to us in this way, through the death of God's only Son, Jesus Christ. To embrace the joy of our salvation, we must be willing to live as Jesus lived on earth and celebrate that beyond this life, there is an eternal life that is ours. I want to leave us this morning with a little bit of food, I hope, for our souls. There was a man who didn't believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, nor the spiritual meaning behind it. As a matter of fact, he didn't really necessarily believe a whole lot about God. His wife and his children, however, were uh, faithful in their belief that Jesus was their Lord and Savior. The husband could often be heard saying, well, that's a bunch of nonsense. Why would God lower himself and become a human like us? That's just ridiculous. This family lived on a farm, and one Sunday after uh, the wife and the children had gone to church, a blinding snowstorm swept in, and the man decided he was going to stoke up the fire, sit by it, and just have a relaxing day. Suddenly there was this loud thump on the windows. He decided he needed to get up and go outside and check on it. And when he did, what he saw was the strangest sight. There, were, were a, um, there was a field full of geese. They were apparently trying to find warmer weather, but they had been caught in the violent wind and in the blinding snow. They were stranded. There was no food. There was no water. And all they could do was just simply flutter their wings and basically fly around aimlessly. So the man decided that he needed to open up the barn doors so that the geese would at least have a place to find shelter and warmth. And he had hoped that they would notice it on their own, but when they didn't, 
he moved a little closer to them, and as he did, trying to guide them to safety, they moved even further from him. So he tried leaving uh, bread along a trail from the field up to the barn, but there was no response still. Growing in frustration, he uh, tried shooing them into the barn a little more forcefully, but all that did was cause them to scatter. And then came the question, why don't they follow me? Can't they see that this is the only place where they can survive the storm? How can I possibly get them into that place that will save them? And then, like the light bulb going off, he realized that these birds were not going to follow him, a human. And he uh, could only save them, he realized, if he became like them. So as he was poised to slowly flap his wings and move toward the barn, he stopped, just stopped. And he heard with his heart what his lips had just said. If I only could become like one of them, I could save them. And in that instant, he understood God's heart toward humankind who became just like us in order that we might be saved. It was in this way that God loved the world. So embracing God's invitation and promise of salvation May we find rest in our Lord as our Savior when the sun rises, when the sun sets, and for all of those moments of eternal living in between. For God so loved the world in this way. His Son went to the cross for our sins that we might have life forever. Amen. Let us together affirm our faith. Jesus taught us to speak of hope as the coming of God's kingdom. We believe that God is at work in our world, turning hopeless and evil situations into good. We believe that goodness and justice will triumph in the end and that tyranny and oppression cannot last forever. One day, all tears will be wiped away, the lamb will lie down with the lion, and justice will roll down like a mighty stream. True peace and true reconciliation are not only desired, they are assured and guaranteed in Christ. This is our faith. This is our hope. From our lips to God's ears, from our hearts to God's heart, may the prayers that we offer up be done in accordance with God's will. Let us pray. We come to you in prayer, O oh God, and we know that your steadfast love endures forever. We pray for a world that is sick through our sinful ways, and we pray that you will come and save us we pray for people in places of conflict and danger this day, for those who give their lives to keep their families and friends, their neighbors safe. And we pray for all of our world leaders and those closer to us. We come to you in prayer, O oh God. We know that your steadfast love endures forever. We pray for a people who are sick and afflicted, those who are sick and afflicted through broken relationships, through hunger and poverty, through their bodies, and Lord, for those who are near death or for those, Lord, who have 
gone on to live with you. We remember those in our own congregation, Lord, those who are waiting on test results, those who are waiting for procedures and surgery. We pray for those, Lord, who are in situations that cause anxiety and pain and hurt. But we also, Lord, come to you giving thanksgiving for all of the good and all of the joy that so many experience. May our joy be their joy, and may our uh, tears be tears that we can share together. We come to you, God, knowing that your steadfast love endures. And so we pray for your church sent to heal and to deliver our world, fueled by fear and bogged down by petty problems, broken by stingy ears and overly lavish egos. And so we pray to you to come together with us. We pray for this congregation gathered and for your whole church universal. May we find our meaning and our purpose, not in this world, but in you. And Lord, we come again thanking you for your steadfast love and for your wonderful works. Remake our lives as thanksgiving sacrifices and then send us out to tell of your deeds with songs of great joy. We ask now that you hear these and all of our prayers. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to save us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture says, I don't speak from want because I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me.
Let us pray. Gracious God, may we never take the gifts of life for granted or fail to give you thanksgiving. May what we have offered today be used for your purpose and in your time. Amen. As we leave this place this morning, if you are in a dark moment, if you are in a dark place, remember Remember that there is the light of the Lord that brings us hope. And for those of us who believe, may we understand the depth of that love and may we with gratitude always remember to share the story of God's love in Jesus Christ. And as we go, May God, our maker, send us back into the world with our energies renewed in such a way that we continue telling this story of good news. May Christ the light illumine all of those dark moments and places of our lives. And may the Holy Spirit of steadfast love guide us, direct us, be in us and among us until we meet again to worship our Lord. Amen.